Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Interesting on those ISMs, uh, expansionary territory here, ISM manufacturing coming in at over 50. So let's get to the man behind the data. Tim Fiore is chair for the Institute of Supply Management's Manufacturing Business Survey Committee. Tim, we knew we were in the trough. Is this legit expansion here? Yeah, absolutely, Alex. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Alex. So this is the third month of recovering demand, and there's not a lot to complain about in this report. I mean, we've got good demand that beat the seasonals, expanded for, uh, you know, it's a, uh, on average, the last three months, it's, a, it's an expansionary period. We had tr- production go up, which is output, pretty significantly. We were continuing to have layoffs, which I think is good, but that should probably end soon. Suppliers are starting to stiffen up. So overall, this is a very good report. Remember, last time we spoke, August, September, uh, we declared that we thought we were in the manufacturing trough. Then January, we indicated that we thought we we're starting to climb out. We climbed out in January, a little bit of February, and even more now in March. So we're well on our path here to a good manufacturing recovery. And, and uh, Tim, you, you always tell us to kind of focus uh, on the new orders, and new orders showed some expansion as well. Yeah, they sure did. They popped back above 50. Uh, we also had pretty significant new export orders. They were flat expansion to the prior month, but they're expanding nonetheless. Backlog was stable, which is okay. It's in the mid 40s. That's all right. That'll come back probably in the early summer. And customer inventories went way too low again, which is very good. So we've got demand increasing. We've got production increasing. We've got staffing being finalized here. We still had a one to one hire to fire ratio, which means that we still have a lot of companies letting people go. 70% of our uh, layoffs, attrition, freeze activities were actually layoffs. So, you know, people are getting a little bit more urgent on, on the tool they use. And uh, like I said, on the input side, we had inventory still contracting, but very, getting very close to 50. Uh, across all the, the industry sectors, they all did well. None of them did exceptionally well, but most of them came in uh, above 50 of the top six. If they didn't come in above 50, they were like 49. So. You know, March is a big manufacturing month. We, we have seasonal factors that hit us. We overcame the seasonal factors. Uh, we only had 30% of manufacturing GDP declining in the month, down from 40% the prior month. And even more importantly, only 1% so of manufacturing GDP contracted below 45. Yes, Alex. So Tim, so you were mentioning uh, the layoffs, like legit layoffs. Um, do we expect that to end if we wind up seeing manufacturing truly recover? Like you mentioned recovery, and I'm wondering what that looks like and then what the reflection is on the job market. So, you know, a couple of reasons. I think companies are cleaning up their staffing. You know, we did a lot of urgent things over the last couple of years to get headcount, uh, probably hired some people that we don't really want to keep. So some of that cleansing is going on. But we are going to cross that conversion line where you need the labor regardless of whether it's 100% productive or 95% productive. So I think we're going to see that layoff activity start to diminish. In fact, I'm going to start to reverse the metric and start to look for hiring activity. So I would guess that probably by June we'll see that slow down, especially for the second half of the year. Tim, thanks so much for joining us. As always, always appreciate getting your insights here for this data. Tim Fury, chairman of the Manufacturing Business Survey, the Institute for supply management. Again, the ISM manufacturing headline number came in at 50.3, signaling expansion above 50. Uh, The consensus was for 48.3, so well above consensus. And last period, uh, last month was 47.8. So as Tim was saying, uh, good momentum there for the manufacturing side. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. The other news that's interesting is UPS as well as FedEx. So th- two things to watch. One, uh, FedEx uh, won a contract to be the cargo carrier uh, for the USPS. Uh, FedEx, on the other hand, uh, failed to come up uh, with a deal, a, a container deal for the government as well. So a little bit of a divergence between the two. So who do we go to? Lee Glasgow, Bloomberg Intelligence, Senior Transport Logistics and Shipping Analyst, who was off last week really? during the biggest shipping logistic nightmare that we've seen oh, in quite a boy, long time. Oh, you timed time. that nicely. Yeah, Lee, did you get a vacation or not so much? 
Not so much. I got woken up pretty early. I was on West Coast time, so uh, it, was, it, was, it was a fun day for me. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine <laughs> hence, that. Hence the beard now. Hence yeah. the beard. He just got a lot older yeah. over the last uh, week or yes. so. So there's a lot to kind of get through. Let's get to uh, the positive UPS news about being that cargo uh, carrier for USPS. Yeah, so, uh, you know, this is somewhat of a surprise. I think most people were expecting that FedEx would lose maybe about half of that business, but they ended up losing all of it. It's about $1.7 to $1.9 billion in revenue. Makes up roughly around 4 to 5% of their express business, maybe 2% of their total business. Uh, so it's, it's a big loss for, for FedEx. And, you know, while FedEx is losing, uh, UPS is gaining. Uh, what's great about this is maybe not so much the the revenue and the yields that it provides. It's, it's the stability of the freight that it's going to be getting into its network. And when you have any sort of a freight network, you want equilibrium, you want, you want to be able to predict what you're going to need in terms of resources. And this provides a good level set of predictability for them. And they can build density uh, onto these uh, routes where the U US Postal Service will be leveraging. Why is the Postal Service making the switch? Uh, that's a great question. They were negotiating with FedEx. I guess the two parties couldn't come to a conclusion in terms of an agreement. Uh, so therefore, they just decided to part ways. Um, you know, one would guess that this is maybe not the most um, high margin business uh, for whether it's UPS or FedEx. But again, I think there is a benefit to having this because it does create a lot of density in their network. Let me ask a silly mm. question. When I'm looking to mail a package, the United States Postal Service does not even come into my mindset. Oh, God, no. No. Whoever so the, wants to go to a who post still office? uses the U.S. Postal <laughs> Service versus FedEx or, or, you know, a UPS store that's right next to the Starbucks in town? I can go, you know, get my coffee mocha there All and the do all things, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I'm not going to the post office. Who uses the post office these days? I mean, I do. I guess I'm not. You do? Uh, but, uh, you know better. Uh, yeah. I, I do so sometimes, but but the reality is the Postal Service, you know, obviously you know, we're not sending letters to grandma anymore, uh, but you know, what we are doing is we're ordering stuff online and the U.S. Postal Service provides a lot of the final mile delivery. So you might be ordering yeah. from a department store or, uh, you know, a dot-com uh, e-tailer and, you know, they might be using UPS and FedEx for the, uh, the line haul, but they might be leveraging the Postal Service for that final mile delivery because the Postal Service, at the end of the day, has to go to everyone's address and it's, mm. it's a cheap way to do it. You know, uh, and as more and more people are willing to, maybe you don't need some, maybe you don't need that t-shirt overnight, you can wait a couple days, you know, injecting that freight into the Postal Service uh, makes sense. And Amazon is a big uh, user of that final mile delivery as well. Mm. My daughter does send letters to her grandmother. Just, nice. I'm just putting that out there. Um, <laughs> on the flip side, and I should point out, they mentioned the margin part of it. So we talked to the uh, UPS CEO last week on television, and their whole pitch is that going forward, they want to focus on margin and pricing over volume. Does this fit into that strategy? Yes and no. So okay. yes, because you know, so so what they're going to be focusing on are uh, verticals like small to mid-size shippers, and those shippers come with very high margins relative to you know large enterprise companies uh, uh, that are out there. So they're going to be really focused on that type of uh, t that type of business. Um, but you know what the what the volumes from the postal service brings is a level of density that you can leverage because it's all about operational leverage, right? You know, no matter what you are in transportation, operational leverage is pretty high because you add like one more piece of freight, that piece of freight tends to have higher margins than the first 20 pieces of freight. And so what this will do is this will probably help them provide a base level of cost coverage uh, and, you know, a profitable cost coverage at, at that. And then all these additional uh, volumes that they're getting from higher margin might even carry or might even carry higher incremental margins for UPS. So long term, it could have a very positive impact on margins. Near term, it might have somewhat of a, a mix, uh, a negative mix shift, if you will. Uh, but, you know, we think that it, it, it does make sense for them to take this, this volume. And other, and other verticals also that they talked about during their analyst day uh, were the, the healthcare vertical, which tends to be highly profitable just because of the, the high touch nature and the high service yeah. level uh, of that freight that goes through their network. So, uh, Lee, looking at the, the air freight companies, the FedEx, the UPS, how is business? How are volumes 
uh, these days? Are they kind of peeled off from the pandemic or how is volume? Yeah, so, you know, we're coming off those highs that we reached during the pandemic when everyone was sitting at home and ordering toilet paper online or at least trying to get some <laughs> toilet paper online. Uh, you know, we're back to a more normalized uh, level. You know, but the reality is that what, what the pandemic has done is it, it really increased that e-commerce penetration. Uh, uh, it kind of, uh, kind of brought, brought the penetration forward by three to five years, uh, which is a net positive. Uh, but, you know, we have to go back to this quote unquote normalization process, which feels like a negative, but it's, it's really not because once we get the space, uh, which I think we're building right now, you know, we should see uh, positive growth from here on out. Well, now since you're back, I can also ask you about Baltimore. Um, what is the news today? Like, where are we? I know that there's some salvage uh, ships that are coming in to try and get the stuff uh, off the bottom uh, of, uh, of the port. Where are we here? How's it going? Um, I'm not there and I'm not, I'm, my hands won't get dirty because I just, I don't have those kind of hands. Uh, but, uh, you know, it could take four to six weeks to clean up the channel uh, area to get the port reopened. Um, you know, obviously to rebuild the bridge, we're talking two to four years, probably closer to four than two. Uh, and, and so it, that's going to take time. The freight that is going to be impacted can be moved to other ports, uh, whether it's coal going to uh, the port of Norfolk uh, uh, versus you know going out of Baltimore. Uh, a lot of roll-on, roll-off equipment, whether it's ag or commercial equipment, uh, in addition to automotives, could go to Philly or New York, New Jersey uh, ports. So, so, so there, there's going to be you know there's going to be other ports that can pull pull the slack. What you're going to see, because we, we track weekly rail volumes, you're probably going to see some volatility in the rail volumes, especially for Norfolk Southern and, and CSX, the two Eastern railroads. And that might make earnings maybe a, a little lumpy or a little lighter than what expectations were. But this is not like a, uh, a huge dislocation like we saw, whether it's uh, during the pandemic. And it's probably even less of, an, of, of a big deal, if you will, uh, than what we saw in the what we're seeing right now in the Red Sea in terms of the impact. Mm -hmm. I think we're gonna. It, this is really like a sh from a supply chain standpoint. It's really a short term um, a negative impact where uh, we'll we'll find the new normal. I guess you know I do say that a lot in, in my job. What the new normal is, uh, but we will we'll find a new normal as freight finds other ports to go short term until the port of Baltimore opens up, which hopefully uh, will be in less than two months time. Hey, Lee, when you talk your, to your institutional investor clients and you're talking about the transportation space broadly defined, where are people most excited? Is it the rails? Is it the trucks? Is it the marine shippers? Yeah, so that, that, that's a great question. I don't really think it's, 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 it's on a um, mode basis right now. I think it's really by a company story. You know, you have uh, Norfolk Southern, where you have a lot of activist investor activist activity going on there. Uh, so there's a lot of excitement about you know how that company can improve its margins. Uh, in the West, you have Union Pacific uh, on on the rail side, where you have a new CEO that comes in with uh, a lot of precision scheduling railroading experience, and uh, you know expectations are he's going to be able to improve margins. And then on the growth side of things in the rail industry, you have a Canadian Pacific. Uh, Kansas City, uh, which is, uh, you know, the byproduct of, of a merger that happened last year. Uh, and they have some great growth opportunities because, you know, they're the only railroad that touches Canada, the U.S. and Mexico. And as you know, near shoring is a long term slow, but long term secular growth story uh, that, you know, we're looking at and, and they're, they're, they're expected to benefit the most from, from there. And then broadly speaking, I, I think people are just waiting to see the truckload cycle, rate cycle start to turn. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe it's gonna happen this quarter. Uh, we believe we're bouncing along the bottom. What happened in Baltimore could kind of give a boost to certain kind of equipment types like flatbed equipment uh, near term here, uh, which could be a great base to, to work on positive pricing, which the truckload industry desperately needs. Uh, Lee, before we let you go, I mean, on that point, we had the ISM manufacturing data um, coming in really strong and it had been expansionary territory for the first time since July of 2022. It has been bouncing along the bottom and troughing for like five or six months. You're sa saying something similar for the transportation sector in some ways. D does it reaccelerate? Like, what does the upturn look like? 
So the ISM index is probably a great precursor to uh, less than truckload demand. So think companies uh, like XPO, Old Dominion, even FedEx has, FedEx Freight is the largest LTL carrier out there. Uh, tonnage has been uh, in decline, uh, sp broadly speaking, uh, and what the ISM usually is, it kind of leads demand by, by three to six months. So uh, the, the fact that it inflected into uh, expansion territory is a positive sign for the LTL space. Um, you know, that's how we look when we're looking at the ISM. All right, Lee, great stuff as always. Appreciate it. Uh, bringing it as he always does. Lee Klaskow, Senior Transportation, Logistics, and Shipping Analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence, uh, coming to us uh, from our Princeton studio via uh, that technology the kids call Zoom. So that worked out for us. Um, yeah, just looking at the, the logistics, it seems like we're back to normalized logistics, getting the, you know, our product from point A to point B, kind of back to where we were, I guess. I guess my, my question is, hmm. what happens to just-in-time inventory? Is that still a thing, or did people learn their lesson? Like, eh, that just-in-time, that's a little too dicey. Maybe but it's, it's Right, but it's not like a huge buildup of inventory, right? It's like you have enough, but not too much, and kind of finding that sweet spot, as I feel like retailers have been trying to find for a bit, yeah. uh, can be quite tricky. Um, you know, but it will be interesting. I, I, I know that we're writing off what happened in Baltimore in terms of logistics. I know I, I know mm. we're doing that. There's space. There's capacity at different ports. Um, railroads have capacity, et cetera. We have to wonder, though, if it doesn't take any shorter than four to six weeks, do we have to rethink the disinflationary trend that we're mm. seeing? Yep. Like not, not inflation, not something crazy, but just, you know, stops, yeah. the, stops the decline. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. We're looking to sell off all across the bond market here, particularly in the long end. And it seems like the good data is going to be bad then for the market. Are we seeing actually a reacceleration of the economy? I think that's going to be my question of the day, Paul. Oh, I like that. We'll yeah. go with it. Let's do it. Carol Pepper is founder and CEO at Pepper International, and she joins us now. Carol, are we seeing a reacceleration? No, I think we're seeing a steady, continuing good performance. Reacceleration would imply that it's going to get a lot hotter too quickly, and it will not allow the Fed to cut. I don't believe that's the case. I think we're just going to continue to see a good, strong, muscular market that's doing well. Uh, I don't see it as a reacceleration. I see it as fairly a steady state, almost a Goldilocks market. Not too hot, not too cold. So, if that back with with that background, Carol, what do you think uh, our Federal Reserve is going to do over in the upcoming meetings? I'm definitely in the camp that says they're going to cut in June because they have no reason to keep the rate so high. I mean, there's just there's not a lot of justification if we don't have rampant inflation and it, the rates being so high do threaten the real estate markets, which in turn threaten the banks. So, you know, a lot of people have been holding on by their fingernails and a lot of banks don't want to take back all that real estate. So they really need to start cutting. Um, OK, so if we just do st so if things are just humming along and doing all right, uh -huh. as you were just saying, is that enough for equities to keep going up? Well, remember, we're going to have the stimulus coming, a real stimulus, which is the cut of interest rates. That will help real estate. That will help banks. That will help consumers because their credit card rates will go down. And but if we don't get that, Carol, if we don't get the cuts or if that gets pushed off even by a month, et cetera, can stocks still go up? Yes, I think so, because, again, we're at the beginning of another level of secular change. I was around trading the Internet when it first launched and everybody said it was too expensive. Don't buy it. And look where we are today. Um, you know, will there be blips? Yes. But the AI revolution really is going to be another huge leg up in productivity. And that's why you see the NASDAQ running as strongly as it is, because people remember, a lot of people, you know, still around, they remember how it worked out last time. So AI is a secular change. Um, the money that's poured, been poured in by the Inflation Reduction Act is a secular change. These are real things that are causing real things to happen in the real world. And those are additional boosts even if we don't get the rate cuts. So there are very positive headwinds. And certainly if you compare what's going on here to the you know, threat of Russia looming over Europe, um, the threat of China looming over Asia, um, you know, where do you go in the world? Middle East or here, really? That's why you see a lot of people moving to you know, UAE and people bringing their money to the United States. Lots of international clients. As you know, I work with family offices. I manage money 
for people with over 100 million who are who have single family offices and they're all looking at the U.S. as a safe haven. And that's going to continue because on a relative basis, the U.S. looks fantastic if you think about going to other regions of the world. So do I stick with my large cap growth stocks, Carol, that have been working for me? Or do I try, try to go out there and find some value? No, no, no. Forget value. Oh, In my opinion, oh, I mean, you can. That was hard. That honestly, was, that was value tough. has, I've been hearing about the re renaissance of value for 40 years. It never comes. <laughs> Okay, it just never happens. It's like waiting for Godot. I mean, the, the United States is a leader in technology globally, and if you stick with the large cap growth stocks, particularly ones with lots and lots of cash on their balance sheet, which you can easily see if you look on you know, any, any um, online Bloomberg system, if you're a trader on Bloomberg Channel, FAA wherever, though. you can see how much cash do they have on their balance sheet. That means they can weather any storm. So, you know, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, these big names are going to continue powering upward. Um, so, okay, to that point, if I didn't own, though, say the Mag 4, Fab 4, mm -hmm. is it too late to do that? Or do I need to just sort of play the themes that you're talking about that are real structural shifts in different ways? No way. You have to play the big guys. Okay. This is a leader's market, and there are lots of fear days coming. Don't think we're done with fear days. Fear days are the days when something spooks the market. Let's say Powell says something that makes the, the traders fret that, oh, he really isn't going to cut. Oh, my God, what's going to happen? And everything will drop like a stone. And you, smart trader, are waiting on the sidelines, and you'll get into those big names. There will be fear days. There will be fear events. That's just the way things roll these days. So on those days, you can get in if you want to get a better entry point. But frankly, you know, I remember when Amazon first came out, and everybody said it was too expensive then. It's, you know, or Microsoft. These are up 200 300,000%. I mean, there's no waiting for the exact right day isn't the answer. The answer is get into those stocks, particularly for your retirement accounts or your kids' college. Stick the stick them somewhere. Don't look at them every day, and just know that you've made a great, solid investment for years to come. EMXC. What is EMXC, and why should we buy it? Okay, EMXC is the Emerging Markets Mexico Fund. So I've been spending a lot of time lately in Mexico. Mexico is the destination for a lot of the nearshoring activity, meaning people are moving their operations out of China's sphere, not only China, but anywhere China, for example, like Hong Kong, anywhere where China has undue influence. They're moving those operations to Mexico. Mexico is on fire. If you go to Monterey, the building is unbelievable. If you go to Tijuana, the building is incredible. Be why? Because all these both European and U U.S. corporations are moving operations there. So that country is doing extremely well. Of course, they have, like, like a lot of countries right now, they're a little nervous about the presidential election coming up. But once we get past that, that country is going to continue to do extremely well. So that's a way with a small percentage of your money to play a trend that's going to only get bigger over time. Does that also you go know, to Canada, job, Carol, or is that purely a Mexico no, play? No, because the wages are too high in Canada. So that's why mm. they go to Mexico. So it's sort of you get emerging market wages and labor in a market that where you can literally, like Canada, drive into the US, but unfortunately Canada doesn't have enough labor to take all of our near shoring and they're they're more like us. They have high wage structure. So that's why people go to Mexico. Do people are people going to increasingly go to India if China mm. is less investable here? A lot of folks have been suggesting that's the next trend uh, in emerging markets. Absolutely. I mean, for example, two important things happen in February, MSCI the index for you know the the rest of the world, if you will, increase the weighting for India, uh, and decrease the weighting for China. India up two points, China down a point. Uh, J P Morgan this coming month is going to be adding India bonds for the first time into their international bond index. So India is muscling in, and China is is falling behind because they're just not playing ball with the rest of the world. So yes, India is a great trend. Right now, it's easier to buy India through some emerging market ETFs that are equity focused. There's really not a lot of great debt options yet, but I think those will come because what ha what tends to happen? The, the street gets excited when, when a country is included in indexes. Now it's worthwhile to go and build products right. around that country.
Um, so that's why there's INDA, which is a great ETF that mm -hmm. you can look at. And there's GLIN. Both of these, you know, GLIN was up 53% last year. It's smaller, but INDA is $9 billion already, and it was up over 30% last year. So, uh, Carol, yes, Carol before we let you go, place. though, I just want to get one take. Like, what's the biggest question? Like, we covered a lot of ground. What's the biggest uh -huh. question you're getting right now from your clients? Well, it's really, will this good time last, frankly? Okay. And I say yes. I say this year, it's an election year, the good time will last. Don't be too frightened and jump out because you're scared and don't try to time the market. Look for long-term trends that will work for you in the right proportion for your portfolio and stick with them. Don't, don't go crazy. Unless you have a day trading account, that's a whole other story. But if you're investing, find the right trends and ride them over the long term. Carol, thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. Carol Pepper, founder and CEO over at Pepper uh, International. So interesting because it just flies in the face of like my philosophy, which is yep. gold and soup cans kind of <laughs> under the bed. Uh, but speaking of gold uh, at a record high, yes. but that, you know, like don't get scared. We'll have down days and sort of buy the dip in the large guys. I always wonder what the first mover advantage is for the AI trade. Yes. Like, do you want to buy the first guys or do you want to buy the fourth derivative fourth guys? I don't know. I mean, a lot of it, Apple investors are suggesting, you know, Apple may arguably has missed the early move, but they often miss the early move. They, mm -hmm. they, they wait for people. And so don't worry about it. Apple will be there. There'll be an AI play there maybe as soon as their June uh, developer meeting. But um, the chip makers have been the ones that are just the clear winners, obviously, right. in NVIDIA. But just a chip sector broadly defined has been, I guess, the initial winners for the AI and then the question is, do you broaden that out to software like a Microsoft and yeah. so on and so forth? And, and then also, I liked your question about value because I feel like the theme of the second quarter is rotation, rotation, broadening out of the rally, broadening out of the rally, uh, the rally. And then she's like, no, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Like, just go by the big guys, yeah. uh, which is quite interesting. Yeah, it's I mean, very aggressive call. Uh, I would say it's even a little out of consensus call sticking with bit. it. And kind of, you know, literally in her notes, she's saying, go out and buy NVIDIA today, basically. Uh, in her notes, so we'll have to see. Uh, so Caro Pepper with some uh, bold call, staying aggressive, if you will. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. S-L-A, Tesla, as Mr. Musk likes to pronounce it. Stock's down 27% year to date. I mean, there's a million cross currents there. So let me just bring in uh, someone who kind of, I think, can clear it up for us, Alex. Steve Mann, he's Global Autos uh, Analyst for Bloomberg uh, Intelligence. Hey, Steve, stock's down 27%. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, stock's down 30% uh, year to date. What's the rub on Tesla right now? What's the big bear case for Tesla? Hey, Paul, thanks for having me on. The big bear case is really, um, you know, how are they going to do this year? Um, you know, EV sales in the U.S. market slowing down. China sales have slowed down as well, you know, even with steep price cuts uh, in, in both regions. And then, you know, they have the Cybertruck ramping up, and, you know, it's not the most easiest uh, product to build, so they're facing some challenges there. So earnings... You know, I think earnings gonna, growth is going to slow down this year. Free cash flow growth is going to slow down this year. So that's the main overhang on that mm -hmm. stock right now. Well, also, we're waiting for first quarter deliveries. Uh, I'm totally unclear as to when we get that number, but it does look like Wall Street analysts are getting more negative and more negative on what they'll actually be, be able to deliver. What, what are you modeling? Yeah, so uh, their number is supposed to come out tomorrow. Okay. But uh, no, if know. you look at... Yeah, if you look at uh, the Chinese uh, auto sales, uh, like NIO, Xpeng, BYD, they all have reported. They had really strong March sales number, but that's on the back of really steep price cuts uh, over the past few weeks. So if you look at those numbers, you kind of infer that probably, you know, Tesla is going to report, you know, probably low single digit growth, maybe flat to, to slightly up year on year in the first quarter. Um, that's, that's pretty much in line with consensus because consensus uh, estimates have come down uh, over the past few months already. So, you know, Steve, what do you, what's your view of, you know, overall demand for electric vehicles? It seems mm. a lot of folks feel like, boy, that, it's kind of peak. The early adopters, they're done. The yeah. tree huggers like Matt Miller, they're done. Um, what's the ultimate demand for EVs, do you think? 
I'm actually optimistic about EV. I think EV, that ship has sailed. Okay. Um, and I think we're just seeing a cyclical downturn. Uh, part of it is because the product that's available to the masses is still not there yet. A lot of the EVs that are on sale today are over $50,000. A lot of people cannot afford $50,000 cars, especially in a high interest rate environment. So I think uh, a lot of the automakers, including Tesla, GM, and, and the rest are introducing more affordable EVs uh, in 2025 and 2026. I think that's gonna expand the market a little bit more. And uh, hopefully, uh, my hope is that, you know, sales will come back uh, at that time. Well, to, to that point, and this ties into uh, Tesla uh, delivery sales, because Elon Musk has talked about the fact that the, getting from their sexy models now to the affordable models later, there will be a sales slump as they kind of fix production and they ramp it up, et cetera. How long mm -hmm. do you think that gap, slump, et cetera, is going to last for? Well, Tesla's going to introduce the, the compact vehicle that's supposed to be, uh, supposedly under $30,000. Uh, they're going to start production in the second half uh, of next year and we probably don't see a con any contribution to profitability and cash flow uh, until 2026 and 2027. So it's not that too far, it's not that far from now um, and you know GM is doing the same thing, they're in reintroducing the, the cheaper version or less lower cost version of the Bolt uh, in 2025 as well. So I think it's, 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 it's not that far away. 2024, like I've always said, it's going to be an adjustment year for, for a lot of automakers. They got to they gotta reevaluate the cost structure, reevaluate the portfolio. And uh, you know, again, this is why I think it's a cyclical downturn. In 2025, 2026, you're going to have cheaper cars, lower costs, and hopefully better earnings for the EV market, EV automakers. So Steve, do we know whether the industry, I'm not even gonna call out Tesla or GM, mm -hmm. can the industry replicate the profitability it has on its internal combustion engine vehicles, which I understand now the unit economics are very good. Can they yeah. replicate that or in the EV space? Yeah, it's very possible um, because battery, you know, lithium prices have come down quite a bit, it's stabilizing at a lower, uh, uh, lower level. Uh, the, the whole auto industry is reevaluating their manufacturing, how they build cars. So vertical in integration has become a very important kind of strategy for automakers to cut costs across the supply chain. That will take time. And then thirdly, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, is supposed to onshore a lot of the, a lot of the battery manufacturing. Again, that is supposed to cut costs <clears throat> for automakers, and that's why I think in 2025, 2026, they're able to roll out more affordable EVs right. at a lower price, and hopefully, you know, if, if volume does get there, um, it's going to be a lower cost per unit. Hey, Steve, 30 seconds. Why is GM at a 52-week high today? Well, they've done a great job in, in managing uh, the investors by, you know, buying stock uh, at a, you know, at a very, uh, buying, spending a lot of money to buy stock at an accelerated rate. And, you know, investors love that, um, that return of cash to, to, to them. Nice. All right. If you can't, you know, beat them, join them. That's a good thing. Steve Mann covers all the auto stuff for Bloomberg Intelligence. We've got a great global team following the global auto uh, business. Uh, Steve just relocated from Hong Kong back to uh, the U.S. to Princeton, New Jersey. So he knows that global auto space, including the Chinese market, which is such a key market for the global auto manufacturers, particularly Tesla, who's got a, a big commitment there. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Again, heck of a first quarter for equity markets, up 10% for the S&P 500. Looking at that October low, up over just over 25%. So a big, big move just in the last five to six months. Uh, have we gone too far? Do we still have more, more room to grow? Uh, let's check in with Christina Hooper. She's a chief global market strategist for Invesco. Christina, again, a lot of people I think are kind of looking back at this first quarter we had and looking back to October and say, boy, that was a nice move. Now what do we do? What are you telling them? 
Well, I think it's important to keep our focus on the longer term. Yes, it seems likely that stocks will take something of a breather after such a strong quarter and such a strong rally since October. But the reality is that we are still waiting for the start of rate cuts, which could very well be a positive catalyst for stocks. We also have a very significant cash sitting on the sidelines that could easily start to move in to equities, as well as fixed income, as rates start to go down. So what we're saying is don't uh, overreact to the environment, um, but be well diversified, because we could very well see a rotation. Uh, for example, one more unnoticed uh, development last week was the Russell 2000 uh, surpassing the high hit in early March. And I think it's a reminder that there are opportunities outside of large cap U.S. stocks. Um, if we go across the pond, if we look internationally, as well as if we look into the smaller cap space. But again, the key is to be well diversified across the major asset classes and within them. So, Christina, does that is that a value call? Or is that just own lots of different things because we don't know what form the economy will really take and what the Fed will do? Well, I, I would argue that it's a call on expectations of what is going to happen later this year and next year. So what I think we're going to see is a rather brief and mild slowdown for the global economy followed by a reacceleration. And typically, uh, asset classes discount um, these events um, before they happen, which is why I think we're starting to see improvement in small caps, why we're seeing a broadening of the stock market. Does a broadening of the stock market include China? There's a lot of folks out there that say China, for a variety of reasons, is uninvestable. What do you think? So I would argue that sentiment has gotten far too negative on Chinese equities. And it really in, it creates a situation in which we could see some, some very positive Chinese equity market performance with a little positive surprise. And an example of that uh, is, is the recent data we saw, uh, the PMI data better than expected. And of course, um, no surprise that we saw a positive reaction um, because China is just, uh, Chinese equities have been oversold. There are opportunities there. Hmm, that's an interesting call. Yeah. Uh, how do you hedge, I mean, do you go internal stocks, like small caps that might get a boost from any government stimulus or is it, you still want to own U.S. companies with exposure, just maybe we have to be selective on what kind of exposure, a la Apple? I think there's there's a case for both, but certainly um, Chinese equities, uh, you know, getting in there, especially areas like China Tech. I think there's there's significant potential there. Uh, I think what we're hearing from Chinese policymakers is a willingness um, to be, you know, of an interest in being very business friendly, and I think there's upside potential there. How about on the fixed income side here, just broadly speaking, do I want to just stick with my two-year treasury at 4.7% or do I want to go out and take some, some credit risk here? So I think in this environment with an expectation of a pretty soft slowdown, um, what, I, what I would argue is that it is a time to take credit risk um, and also move out in terms of duration, locking in rates, because we know um, what is likely to happen in the future in terms of rate cuts. So is that a price appreciation play or is it an absolute yield play? Um, it's it's a little of both. Interesting. Um, and is the U, so how do I then think about the economy in relation to the Fed cuts? I mean, just today, right, we get that nice and hot ISM manufacturing data at the top of the 10 o'clock hour, and we see a pretty sturdy sell-off, particularly in the back end, like higher for longer, therefore growth will be impacted later, et cetera. How do you, how do you view that? 
So I think th there was a real overreaction on, uh, on the part of the market to today's data, and understandably so. There are a lot of jitters out there. We are certainly getting conflicting messages in terms of Fed speak, um, but but the reality is, I don't think anything in that print today changes my view that we will see a rate cut before the end of the second quarter. Um, yes, hotter than expected, but um, we didn't see anything dramatic. Um, and in fact, employment remains tepid, that's sub-index. Um, the price sub-index went up, but it's largely a result of commodities. Um, so, uh, so I understand why we saw the, why we're seeing the reaction we are, um, but I don't believe that's going to change the Fed's mind. I mean, we've seen very, very significant progress on disinflation and core PCE on Friday underscores that. So Christina, um uh, you know, I'm just guess, thinking about an, an environment where interest rates are coming down. What does that mean for real estate? I think that takes some of the pressure off real estate. And we're likely um, seeing a bottom uh, for the real estate market. Um, certainly, for uh, you know, for refinancings that are to come, that will certainly um, certainly be a positive. And we also know, of course, that just there is a pretty strong correlation between real estate prices uh, and interest rates. So I think this is this is a very positive development. Um, the the sooner the better in terms of rate cuts starting for real estate. You, you sound like a very <clears throat> engaged Goldilockser. Uh, I'm just going to coin that term, <laughs> Goldilocks, sir. Uh, what are you then most worried about? Because if, if, if we if we go with the way you're talking about, this could be very good for many different assets, if, uh, et cetera. What do you worry about? So I worry about the Fed weighing too heavily the ghost of Paul Volcker. Mm. Uh, I worry about the Fed having egg on its face from being late to react to higher inflation, and as a result, uh, being more um, more hawkish in um, rate cuts this year, or, or deciding to forego them, or having uh, having a reduced number, I think that could be really problematic. Um, first of all, because markets are expecting um, some level of rate cuts this year, but also because um, what we know is that there are long and variable lags between when monetary policy is implemented and when it shows up in the economy. So we could still very well see damage from what the Fed has done thus far. Um, so to compound that um, by keeping rates at high levels for longer um, would be a mistake in my opinion. All right, Christina, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Christina Hooper, Chief Global Market Strategist uh, for Invesco. This is the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live each weekday, 10 a.m. to noon Eastern, on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, tune in, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.